This video is about generative adversarial networks, otherwise known as GANs. Now we can use them to make images and subsequently movies. First of all, don't worry, this video will contain no maths, no coding, and nothing too high tech or fancy. Just simple old fashioned explanations helped along with lots of movie references, analogies, and basic sketches. So if the sight of these words makes you feel like this, that's okay. Generative adversarial networks are a lot simpler than they sound. And to prove that, we'll break the name down word by word. So the word generative may conjure images of ideas and inventiveness, of creating something or making something. Adversarial might suggest conflict, competition, and opposing forces like good or evil, hero or villain. And network usually refers to a system of interconnected points, like a mobile phone network or a rail network, where towns and cities are connected by tracks. But our minds also contain a network, a network of interconnected neurons, and we call this a biological neural network. And scientists in the 40s were inspired by this feature of our minds and tried to emulate aspects of its behavior using maths and computers and created what we call artificial neural networks. And these are a key component in modern day artificial intelligence and give us the N in GAN. So now we can start to understand GANs as artificial neural networks that generate something using some kind of adversarial method, some kind of competition, like a push and pull, if you like. But what exactly do GANs generate? Well. One of the most popular and impressive things are faces. By this I mean fake faces, faces of people who don't exist, like these. These were generated by a GAN, they are not real. Nor is this video. GAN's been to blame for the recent phenomenon of deep fakes, where they can generate convincing videos of pretty much anybody saying pretty much anything. You see, I would never say these things at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time- uh, It's not just faces either. Guns can generate uh, convincing images of just about anything. And this is adding further confusion to what we consider real and what is fake in this so-called post-truth era. Perhaps equally scary is that GANs are only six years old. They've come so far in such a short period of time. And in terms of innovation lifespan, they're still just babies. They're just getting started. And we'll probably see much more of them to come. Other applications include FaceApp, where you can change the age or gender of photos, they can increase the resolution of images by generating additional detail, uh, generate emojis from photos, and even generate art, perhaps in inverted commas, such as this 2018 painting, again in inverted commas, called Edmund de Bellamy, which sold at the famous Christie's auction for over $400,000, and whose signature bears some of the maths used by Began to create which we'll talk about later. As you can see, GANs are mostly used to create visual content, images, videos, etc. This is their strength, undoubtedly, um, but they are being applied to other domains. Uh, like music, here we have a composition made by a GAN. As you can hear, it's not likely to top any charts, but it does have a nice experimental quality to it, and it's amazing really that it resembles music at all. Uh, Gans can also write poetry. Um, here we've got some extracts. They can range from pretty dreadful to quite thought-provoking. But again, artistic merit aside, it's amazing really that Gans can even string words together coherently, a skill we take years to learn. But perhaps the most entertaining GAN application, in my opinion, goes to this meme generator. 
uh, began takes common meme images and applies its own uh, thoughtful text, uh, which is often gloriously nonsensical. Uh, for more examples, just search for this meme does not exist. And last but not least, GANs can also make quite realistic handwriting of various styles. Uh, all the titles you see in this video were made with a GAN. So now let's look into exactly how GANs generate uh, these sorts of things. But again, don't worry, we'll keep things very simple to start with and gradually up the ante. Uh, remember our network term um, and how this referred to artificial neural networks? Well, our GAN consists of two of these. We have a generator and a discriminator, and together they form an adversarial pair. They oppose each other. To use an analogy, we can think of our GAN as a game of football, with our generator and discriminator being the two opposite sides. Or to use another, we can think of the generator as a criminal and the discriminator as a policeman or a detective. But our criminal isn't just any old criminal. They've got certain artistic pretensions. They're creative criminal. And their crime of choice is art forgery. For example, we want to make fake Van Gogh paintings and pass them off as the genuine article. And our detective isn't just any old detective either, they specialise in art. And their job is to examine paintings and decide whether they are fake, forgeries, or genuine. Uh, so to start with, our criminal isn't very competent. They're just starting out in their criminal career, they're lacking experience and this is reflected in their artistic ability. The forgeries aren't very convincing. But that's okay because initially our detective is also quite useless. Uh, they too are very inexperienced, they don't know the first thing about detective work, Van Gogh or art, and they're easily fooled by the terrible forgeries. But uh, alongside their investigations, our detective undergoes some training. He receives samples of real Van Gogh artwork, lots of samples. And gradually they learn to better identify the real paintings, and thus become a more experienced detective who's better at identifying the fakes from the genuine article. And thus outsmarting a criminal. This forces our criminal to up their game. They become more experienced and they rise the ranks of the criminal underworld. They also get handier with a paintbrush and can make slightly better fakes that are able to fool uh, the current detective. This in turn forces our detective to up their game, to become, again, a better detective who is less easily fooled. And this again forces our criminal to become more professional, a more worthy adversary to our detective who can paint more convincing fakes. This game of cat and mouse continues until our criminal and detective are both at the top of their respective professions. Our criminal is making near perfect fakes and our detective is constantly 50-50 as to whether they are real or not. And just for the sake of interest, the images you can see here were made by a type of GAN called style GAN, uh, which applies different styles to existing images, one of which is Van Gogh's painting style. This process of improving the performance of our GAN is called training, or more specifically, adversarial training. This is because it is the competition between the generator and the discriminator that drives the improvement. And we train again by training the artificial neural networks they contain. Um, but how, how do we train these exactly, these artificial neural networks? Well, it's not too different from how we train our minds, our biological neural networks. These essentially receive inputs, process them, and produce outputs. For example, if our input is that we see a spider, if we're scared of spiders, then our output might be to scream. But we could train our minds to be less scared of spiders by spending some quality time with them and showing our minds that they're not so terrifying after all. This would essentially rewire our neural network structure a little. We strengthen some connections, we weaken some others, so that the next time we see a spider, 
our output reaction would be more relaxed. Training artificial neural networks is based on similar principles. Both are generator and discriminator networks, um, receive inputs and produce outputs. Our generator receives a sequence of random numbers and produces a fake image. By fake, we just mean it's been generated, it's artificial. And our discriminator receives an image, processes it and produces a single number between zero and one. This is a prediction on whether that image is real or fake. One for real, zero for fake. And all this input and output takes place in batches. So a generator receives a batch of random numbers and outputs a batch of fake images. The quantity of uh, this batch is determined by our batch size parameter. This is highlighted in yellow because it's a variable in our model. It's something we can, we can change. Uh, our discriminator would then take the batch of fakes from a generator, process them and produce a batch of numbers between zero and one. And our discriminator's goal is to make all these numbers zero, i.e. to classify the fakes made by the generator as fake. Whereas contrary to that, the generator's goal is to make these numbers one, to fool the discriminator into classifying the fakes as real. It's a bit like the networks are in a tug of war. And this is the adversarial mechanism that drives the training. Over time, both sides get stronger. And back to the discriminator, for every batch of fakes it receives from a generator, it will also receive a batch of real images, i.e. real Van Gogh paintings, for example. Um, these batches, these real batches come from a bigger set of real images we call our training images. This again is in yellow because it's a variable in our model. We can vary what images we give our GAN and the quantity. Basically, the more we give it generally, the better our GAN will perform. So our discriminator has another goal of correctly classifying these training images as real, of aiming for output values of one. So in total, our GAN now has three classification goals. And going back to our painting from earlier, its signature is how we express these three goals in mathematical form. And we call this expression our loss function. And this acts as our feedback me mechanism for our training process. So back to the discriminator, we have two batches of images going in and two batches of predictions coming out. And these are then fed into our loss function. And this basically tells us how we did and what we need to change. And this gets fed back into our networks, both generator and discriminator, and adjust them accordingly, strengthen some connections, weaken some others. And this is how we train our networks. We then repeat this process for another batch and another, and we keep going until we've cycled through all our training images once. At this point, we've trained our model for a single epoch. And number of epochs is a variable in our model. Uh, we can set our GAN to train for any number of epochs, 10, 20, 100, for example. Okay, so now it's time to look more into the nuts and bolts of how our generator and discriminator actually do what they do. So when we say our generator outputs an image, we can consider this image a grid of pixels or values, each between zero and one. Same goes for our input, only it's a smaller grid of values. So for now, we'll just consider it a grid of a single value. So our generator essentially takes a small amount of data and extrapolates or expands this into a large amount. And it does this through its artificial neural network. To start with, we can visualize this as something like this, where our circles are called nodes. And these represent values and our lines represent mathematical operations. Our network also contains layers. And we can notice that between layers, every node 
circle is connected to every other node in the neighboring layer. And as we go through our layers from left to right, um, we notice that the number of nodes or values is increasing. And this continues until we reach our desired output size. And this is how we go from a small amount of data to a large amount. To use an analogy, we can think of this as a bit like the process of evolution. We start with something very simple and progress to something very complex. And the discriminator is just the reverse of this process, one of compression. We take a large amount of information in and reduce it into a small amount. And we can think of this as similar to the big convoluted experiments you see in movies. We have lots of apparatus and loads of ingredients, and these all get filtered down, distilled, processed into something useful, something typically smaller and more concentrated. And in our case, we are condensing our complex image into a single drop, a single attribute, whether it's real or fake. So far, we've just visualized our neural network layers in one dimension for simplicity, just as columns of nodes. But now let's go deeper into the rabbit hole and see how they look in two dimensions, something like this where each layer is a two-dimensional grid of nodes, and each node represents a pixel in an image that, through our layers, is gradually increasing in size or resolution uh, until we reach our desired output size of our image. In a traditional artificial neural network, all the nodes in one layer are connected to all the nodes in the next layer. So if we were to consider layers two and three, top right node in layer two would be connected to every node in layer three, as would the bottom right node connected to every one. And same goes for the other two. And this is a lot of connections. So even if we were to generate a very um, low quality image like this, it would involve a huge amount of connections and therefore a huge amount of information or data. And that would likely overload even a very powerful computer. computer. Um, but luckily the creators of GANs in their wisdom had a trick up their sleeve to reduce the number of connections. And this trick can conveniently be explained by this image. So for example, this region of the image bears absolutely no relation to this region or this region in its content. If we generated this image, connections between these regions of pixels would be completely pointless. However, uh, these pixels are related more closely to um, its immediate surrounding pixels and connecting these regions would be more useful. Uh, in terms of our generator, again, where pixels equal nodes and looking again just at layers two and three instead of connecting every node to every other uh, we just connect its neighboring nodes or pixels uh, these which are more directly related to one another and thus reducing the number of connections we have into a more manageable amount uh, we refer to artificial neural networks that apply this trick as convolutional neural networks. And exactly the same goes for our discriminator, just the reverse process, where our pixels again represent nodes, and we're just looking at our second and third layers, and we're only connecting to the neighboring nodes, thus reducing the overall number of connections from a huge amount to something more manageable, and thus giving our computer a much easier time. Now let's go a step deeper into the rabbit hole again, and look at the same process, but in three dimensions. So we may think of color images as flat 2D objects with just a height and a width. 
but they also essentially have a depth. They contain a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. In data terms, this is like having uh, three grids of pixels on top of each other, or a volume of data that is three pixels deep. And save me drawing lots of lines, we will just visualize this as one big cube. So our discriminator in 3D takes in this color image, this volume of data that is three pixels deep. And through the layers, it compresses the face of that volume, the height and the width, the image, if you like, but simultaneously expands its depth. So the volume of data through the layers stays the same. We have no loss or gain of information. We're just reshaping it. And again, we reduce the area of the face, expand the depth, and again. And we can imagine these volumes as stacks of cards, playing cards. And visualize that analogy, something like this, where to start with, we have very few cards, which are very detailed. So just three cards, each very detailed, just for red, green, and blue channels. And as we go for our layers, our cards become more in number, but they become less detailed, they have less features. And again, um, this process continues until we have lots of cards with each card representing an individual ingredient or, or feature that makes up this image. And as a result, we refer to these cards as feature maps. And these all inform the final output of the discriminator, the final card, if you like, which is just the verdict on whether the input image is real or fake. And exactly, it's exactly the same with the generator, just in reverse. So our generator converts a sequence of random numbers into lots of low level abstract feature maps and then through the layers, these number of cards or feature maps becomes less and more detailed and more detailed until we have three very detailed um, feature maps, which represent our red, green, and blue channels. And these are our generated image. And we can control the amount of feature maps in our generator and in our discriminator with two parameters in our model number of generator features, number of discriminator features. And these essentially determine the strength of our generator or discriminator. Uh, the more feature maps we have, the, the stronger the generator or discriminator is in their tug of war with one another, this adversarial contest. Um, these variables are very useful because sometimes the tug of war can be in balance. One side, usually the discriminator can win, as in it's finding it very easy to, to spot the generator's fakes. And here our adversarial training completely collapses. This is like playing chess against someone who is much better than you. Neither side is learning or improving because the contest is way too uneven. Whereas if we have sides of similar ability, opponents who are more worthy adversaries of one another, uh, both sides learn and progress in tandem. So if we have an imbalanced, an imbalance between our tug of war, our generator and our discriminator, uh, for example, where our discriminator is too strong, we can restore balance by reducing the number of discriminator features or increasing the number of generator features and restore the balance in the contest and restore our adversarial training mechanism. Okay, so let's talk about the list of random numbers that goes into our generator. This list can be of any length. For example, it could be of length six, like here, containing six random numbers. And we could think of this as six rolls of a dice but where the dice gives us numbers between zero and one. But if our input was of length three, 
we could imagine this as a random coordinate within three-dimensional space, an x, a y, and a z. Similarly, if uh, our input was of length 4, we could imagine it as a coordinate in four-dimensional space, just adding another axis. And if it was length 5, a coordinate in five-dimensional space, six dimensions, seven dimensions, eight, etc. And we can control the length of our input with the nz parameter in our model, making our input a coordinate in nz dimensional space. And we call this space our latent space. But how do we visualize a space with more than three dimensions? Well, over the years, Hollywood has had a pretty good go at this, visualizing these extra dimensions as, among other things, a labyrinth of bookshelves, a room with lots of red curtains, a pool of black inky liquid, and lots of really, really colorful lines. But without the kind of budget of a Hollywood production, we'll instead seek the advice of Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called godfather of artificial intelligence, who said to deal with a 14-dimensional space, visualize a three-dimensional space and say 14 to yourself very loudly. Everybody does it. So let's just do that and visualize our latent space of many dimensions as a simple three-dimensional cube where a random point gives us a random coordinate, a list of random numbers that goes into our generator and outputs an image. Similarly, another random coordinate would yield another image and another and another. And then we can link all these random points via a path through our latent space and get more coordinates from this path, therefore get more images. And an interesting feature of our latent space is that similar coordinates give similar images. So our path or journey through the latent space then gives us a sequence of progressively changing images. And since a movie is just a sequence of progressively changing images played at 24 frames a second, like this, Our path through the latent space can therefore give us a movie. Okay, so let's look at an example with sunsets. So we give our GAN lots of training images of mostly sunsets, about 2,000 in total. And our generator then learns through adversarial training with the help of all the training images to generate its own images of sunsets like these. Uh, which were created after about 250 epochs or half an hour or so of training. So our generator takes random coordinates from our latent space and transforms these into images of sunsets. And a different uh, random coordinate will give us an entirely different sunset and another and another, all very different. We can then connect these random points in our latent space together, creating a path and subsample this path to get more points, which will then create images between the different sunsets, but gradually transition from one to another. And then if we string all these um, images together at 24 frames a second, we have a movie of in this case, an ever-changing sunset, as you can see. Uh, how smooth uh, these transitions are in our movie, we can control with the smoothing parameter in our model. And this determines how many in-between images we have sampled on our path through the latent space. So if we reduce our smoothing factor, we sample this path less and less uh, so that our movie has quicker transitions. 
and it's essentially less smooth between the different random images. Uh, this sunset again is an example of what I'd call a specialized network where we've trained our GAN to make uh, just an image of one type of thing. We have one class of image. Uh, same goes for the face generation. It's just making faces. And our journey through the latent space gives us very specialized, very little images with slight variations. But we can achieve something uh, more surreal or more weird if we give our GAN less specialized and more varied training images, uh, like those of a movie. So movies are a great source of images with a two hour movie containing about 170,000 uh, images and that are so varied in their content. Um, so let's look at an example where I've, uh, from a two hour movie, I've taken 14,000 um, images. So I've grabbed a frame approximately every half a second. And this gives us lots of training Im images of huge variety of content. And we can then generate images with our GAN that look something like this. Very kind of strange and surreal. Maybe from a distance they look uh, like they could be stills in a movie, but upon closer inspection it's just strange shapes and forms. So again here, each point in our latent space is giving us an output image that is completely different. And again, we can join those points, create a path, subsample the path, and get our in-between images, the gradual transition between our different random images. And we can string all these together and get a movie. And this, uh, with the, the varied content of the movie stills, this becomes like a strange, strange mixture of shapes and forms. Some may be recognizable briefly, some less so. And if you want to make movies like this, you can just go to this GitHub address and follow the instructions. Again, you don't need to know anything about coding. You, you literally just need a Google Drive account and to follow the instructions. And to get movies, to train your GAN with. Uh, there are lots of movies in the public domain without copyright uh, that you can download off this address. Uh, similarly, you could um, get this add-on in the Firefox browser, and it means you can just download videos straight from most websites like YouTube. So congratulations for making it this far. I hope you had a good time didn't find the experience too painful and that you learned something along the way. Thanks for listening.